we're getting to the end of the letters to the churches. So we're going to take up the church of Laodicea, or as F.W. Grant puts it, what brings the time of Christ's patience to an end. Oh boy, this is quite a, of all of them, I find this one the most convicting because it speaks the most directly to, to us in this day and time. Laodicea. Well, let's read the passage. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness be not revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous. Repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, here we are in our final number seven here. And if, if you notice in that map, it's kind of going in a clockwise order, you know, kind of time marches on. And we're, we've looked through the history of the Christian church as we've gone through this. And we're getting to the end there. It does not go back to number one. It does not go back. This is the end of things. And, and not the end of the church as existing in, in representing the Lord Jesus on this earth, but the end of the real church, because there will be a church during the tribulation. There will be a false church during the tribulation. There are going to be a lot of people, a lot of people, I would estimate most of the people who are in churches will go through the tribulation. You know, so it's like, are you going to go through the tribulation or not? If you're going through the tribulation, that's a bad sign. That's a bad sign because you believe the lie. Well, it will continue on in falseness, but this is the end of the history of the churches. Well, Laodicea. What do we know about this place, Laodicea? Well, it was located, as we saw there in Asia Minor, and it was at the intersection of three major roads. And you get major roads coming in, kind of like Dallas or Oklahoma City, as opposed to Tulsa. You got more major roads, so you have more wealth, more industry, more things going on, and Laodicea became a very rich place. Lots of millionaires, lots of, uh, lots of theaters, lots of shopping centers, all kinds of things were going on in Laodicea. It was a very wealthy place. It was also a place that was known for its textile industry, only this special textile, as opposed to Thyatira, where they had the red cloth, they had black cloth. It was known for a nice, deep, rich black cloth. They also had an industry in an eye salve, that they had an eye ointment that was known all around the region that would, that would help cure diseases of the eyes. They also had not so far from there some hot springs with medicinal waters that could cure things. But if you let it sit out and get lukewarm, it would make you sick. Now, I say those things because we're going to find all these things show up in the Lord's discourse to the church of Laodicea. Now, the name Laodicea means the rights of the people or people's rights, and how well this defines the era in which we live. 
the era where the individual rights seem more important than the collective rights, we call it democracy. Now, it was, it was looked at, dabbled at during the Romans and the Greeks and so forth. They dabbled with democracy. They dabbled with republics. But nothing like what has happened in our day and time. When the United States was formed as a nation, okay, it was a big deal because up till then, all the nations for hundreds of years, centuries, had been ruled by monarchies. In fact, if, if you look on your dollar bill, if anybody still owns any of those things, if you look on your dollar bill, it says on there, what is it? A new world order. Something started then that has continued on. That is, the people now will decide what goes on. Now, our framers of the United States were smart enough not to let it be a pure democracy, but to let it be a republic. So the democratically elect representatives to put put somebody over the thing so that it wouldn't go crazy. That's not working too good, is it? Anyway, the whole, the whole concept here of, of the people's rights, and then it, went, then it went really berserk, didn't it, in France. France, France, you ever been? Yeah, yeah, off with your head. So what happens? Everybody, everybody does what they want to do, everybody, whatever's right in, in any man's eyes, and all of a sudden, because rights are in a tricky thing, people's rights, because when the United States was started, our framers made a comment that we have certain inalienable rights who, that what? That endowed by our creator. Now there are rights that come from God, but the rights that happened over in France were without God. So who gets to decide what's right? The person with the guillotine gets to decide what's right. So that's what happened over there. And that's what's happened in many places as the United States has gone out and go, let's get democracy all over the world. And you give them democracy and they, they vote in creeps. They vote in tyrants. They vote in awful people. Mm. Laodicea, the rights of the people. Well, F.W. Grant, over 100 years ago, put it this way. He's one of my favorite uh, expositors, he put it this way. This thing this is written over 100 years ago. People's rights, the right of the masses, and which the masses themselves mean to define and pronounce what is right. Here is the condition of which Hobbes, that's Thomas Hobbes, and if the rest of you are as dumb as I am, probably so, uh, dumb as I am, and you probably have read a comic strip called Calvin and Hobbes. Well, that wasn't just by random names. Hobbes was a political scientist of the 1600s. And Hobbes came up with the thesis that a a monarchy was the best because if you let the people decide, you would have chaos, that we needed a top-down structure. Okay, so he's quoting Hobbes. Well, how did I get into Calvin and Hobbes? You know, you got your, <laughs> you got your but look how clever Watterson was. Take a theologian and a political scientist and put them together. Oh, anyway, that's it. Here's the condition of the things that Hobbes, more than two centuries since, declared to be the natural condition, and which he rightly said meant universal chaos. For who is to judge as to these conflicting interests? And who is to enforce the judgment? You guys ever hear about what's going on in like in like in Portland and Seattle and you just crash into stores and take whatever you want? Hmm. You get rid of the police? Have you ever heard about this? Okay, okay. This is written a hundred years ago. Class will disagree with class, nay, individual with individual, and every man's hand will be against his brother. Might will make right upon a scale that the world has never seen until out of this surging sea, a power arises strong enough to command once more. Then they that will be Lord shall have a Lord, and they that will not receive Christ shall have the Antichrist. This is written a hundred years ago. Rights, what scale have you of rights? 
Listen to the voices from a lower level than you desire, which you will, which will interpret for you and enforce their interpretation. Socialism, communism, nihilism, dreaded names, not merely for the monarchy, but for the man of property also, and for the law-abiding citizen. People's rights are already in terrible conflict with one another, and in their name, how many wrongs may be inflicted yet? A few must yield to the many. And then he goes over to the church. They choose their pastors as they choose their lawyer or their doctor and insist upon having what they pay for. What can be a better right than that? Thus, however, it is clear they heap to themselves teachers because they have itching ears. The laity may dispossess the clergy and dominion pass from one class to another without reverting to the hands to which it really belongs. Christ alone is master, not the people. Well, <clears throat> interesting, written quite a while back and describing us perfectly today. Well, let's look at our outline as we've gone through the other churches, the picture of Christ, the position of the church, and the promise of the Spirit. And we define this period somewhere in the late 1800s, 1900s, when things really blossomed out all over the Western world, and we'll continue on to the rapture. First of all, let's look at the picture of Christ. And to the angel of the church of the Laodicea and to write the things, says the amen, the faithful and true witness in the beginning of the creation of God. First of all, remember, as we see the problems of the church, the Lord, first of all, presents the solution as himself. He is the solution. He is the solution. As we heard there in, in 1 Corinthians 15, all things are, are headed up into him, and then he hands them to the Father. He is the solution. And so the first of all, we have the confirmer, the amen. Or as we might say it in Oklahoma, amen. Amen. This little Hebrew is this the aw, not the eh. Hey, okay. The amen. And what does this amen? Well, as you read through the Gospels, you'll see this phrase, verily. Or truly, or as John puts it, verily, verily, or truly, truly. It's real, that word really is the, the Hebrew word, amen, which was just taken over to Greek and still stay amen. It's the same word. It's a word that we find used. Well, the first occurrence of it in the Old Testament is when the, the woman is accused of of unfaithfulness by her husband, and she's taken in, and they pronounce this curse on her if she is found, and it, found guilty and drinks this water from the dust from the temple. Oh, what a deal. And, and then she has, to, she has to repeat the curse and say, amen. Now, it means so be it. True. This is the way it is. Now, then we find out a whole bunch of times when the children of Israel get on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and they say the blessings and the curse. And when they say one of those curses or the blessings, and they say, amen. Now, we say amen or amen. We say it. It's kind of like a period, okay? I mean, as soon as I say it, everybody can look up, okay? You can, you can eat now, okay? It, it, but it really means, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's a seal, it's an oath. You're saying, I agree with everything that we just said, this is true. So be it. So the Lord Jesus is the, so be it. He's the, he's the seal of, of God. Of everything that, the, that God has said, everything that God has done, the Lord Jesus says, yeah, that's the way it is. I am, I am the amen. I, I am the total agreement of all the purpose, plans, and revelation of God. Well, that's the solution to the problem of most of our problems of bowing to his perfect rule and his perfect revelation. It's, it's a, this amen is also mentioned in 
And in the first chapter that we have gone through, he says in Revelation 1, 6, and he has made us kings and priests to his God, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our position, this is the way it is. Then he says in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they who have pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of him. Even so, amen. His promise. Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. His power. He is the one who concludes everything. As it says in 2 Corinthians, it says, uh, let me quote it. For all the promises of God in him are, yea, and in him, yeah, amen. This is the truth of things. So staying on track, staying on track with the truth. And then he says, he is the faithful and true witness. Again, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, he says, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. You not only say that this is the truth, but you show it. You live it. Who is the Lord Jesus? He says, I'm altogether that which I say. There, there's no falseness in me. Interesting little quote in 1 Timothy, that the Lord Jesus gave a good confession a good witness before Pontius Pilate. He's the one who you could look at him and there was no fault. You could look at him, there was no unevenness. You could look at him and he was everything he said, he did it. Oh, not like us so much, right? Not like the Laodiceans, as we'll find out. They have something that they say about themselves. Well, you're going to witness about yourself. It doesn't matter if you're a good witness or a bad witness, I guess, because yourself is not the thing you need to witness to, but you need to witness to the Lord Jesus. You need to witness about the truth of God. He's the faithful and the true witness. He never gave up. He's the creator. He's the beginning of the creation of God. Now you can look at this a couple of ways. We know that all things were made by him and through him. Without him, not was anything made that was made. He made all things. All things exist in him. All things exist for him. All these things exist to him. He's the beginning. But I think maybe he's talking about here about what we call the new creation. There's this old creation that is passing away. Boy, does it ever pass away, you know? Smile while you still have teeth. But I saw another one that said, the reason that we start losing our eyesight as we get older is so we won't get scared while we walk by the mirror. There's some truth to that. At least for me, there is truth, okay? It, there's, a, there's This old creation is passing away. It's dying. It is corrupted. We're not trying to remake this world. We're not trying to make it a better place. When the Lord Jesus died, he died as the last Adam. You hear right? Last Adam, the last man. God is finished dealing with men after the flesh in order to prove that they can't get to heaven by themselves. It's over. It's over. It don't matter what kind of government you try to make. It doesn't matter who you elect. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It's over. This world is just playing out the hand that's been dealt with to it now, and it's going to end in a ball of fire. And those who want to be part of this first creation and not part of the next creation, they will end in fire also. But there's a new creation. There's a new creation. As we read there in the first chapter of Revelation, the firstborn from the dead, there's a new creation. Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians, says, he says, even if we knew Christ after the flesh, we know him thus no longer. That's not the level upon which we know the Lord Jesus. We're not down here trying to do everything he did so that we can show who he is. No, no. We have a man in glory, resurrected, 
in a resurrection body, seated at God's right hand. This is a whole new creation. He says, even though if we knew him that way, we know him thus no longer. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. What did he tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. Why? Because the first one didn't work. The first one is under judgment. You must be born again. The new creation is such, it's such a wonderful truth. It's something that we must abide in. So Paul says in Galatians, you know, neither circumcision avails for anything or uncircumcision avails for anything, but a new creation. And that's how we need to live. That's how we need to deal with the affairs of life and everything else around us. It's not this world. It's the one to come that matters. Well, he's presenting himself. Wow, this is pretty marvelous, isn't it? To know somebody like this, the amen, the true and faithful witness, and the one who is the beginning of the creation of God, and know that I'm a part of that, that would keep me from being a Laodicean. But let's find out about those Laodiceans. Their condition. Well, first of all, their temperature. Pretty familiar verse and concept that we talk about every once in a while lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. Well, what about cold? Well, you know, on a, on a hot summer day, on a hot, it's nice to have a, a cool glass of water. In fact, it's the same word for cold that the Lord uses in Matthew for those who give a cold cup of water to the weary. A cool cup to to, to to, to cool down your hot head, to, to cool down the, the temperature that's going through you, to refresh you. He said, I wish that you were cold. I wish that you were refreshing. I wish that, that, that the, the sinner who is bound for a lost eternity, the flames are licking at his feet, that you can give them the coolness of the love and grace of God. That you can tell them, look, there is a place of refreshment. There is a place of peace that you can enjoy. Please know this. He says, I wish that you were cold, though, so that you could refresh those who are weary, those who know the pangs of judgment in their soul. He says, then I wish, I wish you were hot for those who are cold. For those whose hearts are cold and, and away from God and, and away from, the, from, from wanting to be responsible and cold, frigid to the gospel, I wish you were hot. I wish you'd give a, give a word to them to tell them to shake them up, to tell them that there is judgment, to tell them that Christ bore this judgment, but he bore judgment. There must be righteousness. There must be conviction. And so he, be, be hot. Jude puts it like this. On some, have compassion. Be the cool, cool water. But on others, he says, others save with fear. Be hot. Pulling them even out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Lord Jesus, be cool or be hot. But the thing about cold and hot, either way, it takes energy and care to get there. All right? Hot coffee doesn't come, just doesn't just show up on your counter in the morning. Well, it kind of does, if you're married to Martha. It, but it takes energy, it takes effort to come up with it, to get hot. And the cold, man, you got to have that refrigerator going. You got to have fruit, got to have it plugged in. You got to be paying your bill to get things cold. Takes energy. It takes certain effort to get it there. What does it take to get lukewarm? Nada, nothing. If you do nothing, you'll be lukewarm. You'll be the temperature of the world. If you're not seeking to do the Lord's will. If you're not seeking to portray him in the gospel as it truly is, he says, you'll go to a lukewarm state. 
Now remember we said that there were those waters around Laodicea, mineral waters that had medicinal values unless you let them come up the room, come down the room temperature. And it says then they would make you sick. What a strange thing. You see, the Lord's using a reference that they know of. He said, look, if you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And you guys know what I'm talking about. They say to the layoffs, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I don't know, you know, spew or vomit. I think, you know, vomit, we think about the contents of the stomach. Spewing, we think about the contents of the mouth. All right. Has anybody ever had that experience of taking a glass of milk and putting it in your mouth and then finding out that it's sour? Have you, have you had that experience before? Now, let, do you go ahead and swallow it? Yeah, get it out as quick as you can, looking for a place to exit it. That's what he's saying, I think. This, I don't want this in my mouth. This is not what represents me. Uh-uh. And he spits it out. Now, what that means in a way it's worked out, I'm not so sure, but I'll tell you what, it doesn't sound good at all. It doesn't sound good to be spewed out. He says, this is your warning. You're neither hot nor cold. Well, let's look at their testimony. They say... I am rich, wealthy, and have need of nothing. So their testimony, is it about the Lord Jesus? No, it's about themselves. We're rich. Well, we're wealthy. We don't need anything. We're doing pretty good. It's a scary thing. When a, a congregation or a church or assembly starts patting themselves on the back, hey, we're doing okay. We're a good bunch. Notice that a lot of it revolves around money. The Church of the West today, especially the Church of the United States, you ever see any of it that revolves around money? Oh, boy. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. If you're, not, if you're not wealthy, it's because you're out of God's will. God's will means wealth. He became poor so that you could become rich. Oh, it's a surprising that God in his grace and that lightning doesn't come down and strike these people. It's so awful. But yet, it's big money. And big numbers, oh, big numbers, not just this little handful that we have here. No, we're talking about tens of thousands gathered together for these people to listen to this about money. You say you're doing good. You say you want everybody else to do good. Uh -uh. No, you have need of nothing. Ooh, I'd hate to hear that from here. Well, we have intense needs, needs of a spiritual temperament, especially. Now, financially, we're living in the United States, and we can complain about taxes, and we can complain about inflation, and we can complain about all. But look, we've got it made. In the United States, we're wealthy. We're wealthy. Go to a third world and see what real poverty is like where they're living under tin and living in ditches and hoping they can find some trash to eat. And we have wealth, and we have responsibility with that wealth, don't we? We have responsibility with it. But wealth does not define spirituality. Just because you have more doesn't mean the Church of America is better than the other churches. Well, their testimony is rich, wealthy, and they have no need, based upon the world's opinion of what is good and what is peace and what is safety. But how does the Lord define them? Wretched, miserable, 
poor, blind, naked. Yuck. There's the real testimony of their real condition. They look at one another and they say, hey, you're looking pretty good. We're looking pretty, kind of like Adam and Eve, all right? Hey, let's sow up some good fig leaves. Now, the fig leaves back there are a little bit bigger than, than some of the figs that we have here. They have little big old leaves. And I suppose they look just fine sporting around in their fig leaves. And I said, Eve, you look quite, you look quite ravishing in that. And, and Eve says, and I'm like, you know, you'll look pretty good in that new suit too. We're, and then you're just walking around and they're quite satisfied with themselves until they hear the voice of God and they say, I was naked. I was naked. All the wealth, all the self-satisfaction that is in the world will not cover you with the righteousness of Christ. And it will not stand in his sight. He says, you're, you're wretched. That's a word that, that Paul uses in, in, in Romans chapter 7. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Mr. John Newton made some good money off of No, he didn't make any money. He, he, his, his song was, has gone a long way, isn't it? To save a wretch like me. He says, this is what you are. You're wretched. You're, you're, you're awful. You're 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 pitiful, miserable. That's a word that's also translated pitiful. He says, if we alone, if we if in this world alone we have hope in Christ and not not in his coming, we're the most pitiful. Pitiful of all people. You're pitiful. Just like who would want to be like that? He says, You're pitiful, you're poor. No, wait a minute, we're rich. No. You haven't put your treasures in heaven. You're poor. You're blind. What's this guy Samson? Blind. You, you are naked. So what do they need? His counsel is they need to receive something. He says, you need to buy from me. Well, what are you going to use to buy from God? Huh? They got any heaven dollars or anything? What? I mean, how are you going to do this? Well, Isaiah tells us, ho, oh, everyone is thirsty, come to the waters, and he that has no money, come, buy, and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. You can buy it with the grace of God. You can buy it with the grace of the Lord Jesus. Why does he use the term buy then? Well, these guys were merchants. They understood the concept of, we don't have this, it's coming down the road, we need to get it. They understood the concept that it was if you have buy things that are of value, right? Buy things that are of value. They understood that they needed it, that it's valuable, and they had to get it. And he says, come and buy from where are you going to get it? From me. What do you need? Gold. Gold that's refined with fire. The things of God, as you get into the the, the tabernacle and the temple, as you go inside the holy places, the things are gold. The things of God are gold. The things, especially when you get there into the mercy seat and the, and the ark, when you get to things there and you think of the Lord Jesus at the cross and being that mercy seat of being the one who could represent us, it's all gold. Learn about the Lord Jesus. Learn about his greatness and his goodness. Set your sights on the real value. And why did Paul, he, he says, you know, Paul he says in Philippians, he said, I have all this stuff. I mean, I've got the pedigree. I've got all the activity. He says, but I pursue, I run that I may know him. That's, that's the gold. That I may know him, that I may be found in him. You guys are rich. No, this is the kind of, you guys have your black clothes there in Laodicea. Wait a minute. You need some white robes. You need to put on the Lord Jesus in such a way that you live the Lord Jesus. That you honor him in what you say and do. You need to, you need to, that when people see you, 
They see a representation of the Lord Jesus. Put on your ambassador clothes so that people know that's who you are. You need to do that. You need to be able to see. You guys have eyes to have here in this place. You need to realize that. You need to see things through the eyes of the Spirit of God revealing Christ. That's what you need. Come and buy it from me. I'll give it to you. Well, he says, as many as I love. Well, there's what the Lord Jesus says. I know. He says, I'm not being harsh on you because I have some big ego and I need myself to look good. I'm not harsh on you just because all I can do is be hard. He says, I'm doing this. I'm saying this because I love you. I love you. I don't want you to change. I want you to repent. We've heard that word several times in these letters, haven't we? What's that mean? It doesn't mean to, to tr turn over a new leaf and try to do better. It means to say, I was wrong. The Lord Jesus was right. Not only chance of me doing right is to run to him. That's repentance. Repentance, as, as the scripture says, is towards God. It's towards God. I want you to repent. I want you to be zealous. Now, that's this word zealous here, the play on words, it's, it's related. It's more, it means to be hot, like the hot drink that we talked about earlier. I want you to be hot. I want you to be hot in your affections and your love towards me. I want you to come to me. I want you to be zealous. I want you to repent. Well, what's that leave us with? The promise of the Spirit. A very famous verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, this has been used so often for the unbeliever, for the, for the person who needs to get saved. And it's okay to use it for that because, look, there were a lot of unbelievers in the church that needed to be saved. And he was, he's outside. What is the deal with the Lord being outside? He's the one who stands in the midst of the candlesticks, right? But here he is. By the time we get to Laodicea, he's outside. But what's he doing? He's not just standing there going, well, I hope you guys open this door. I hope you wake up one of these days. I hope you see the mess you got yourself into. No, he's knocking. He's knocking. He's making a sound so that they might hear him, so that they might respond to him. He keeps on knocking, keeps on knocking. Open the door. Maybe you've seen that picture of, of the Lord Jesus. I should put it up there, knocking at the door. And as one guy said to the painter who did it, he says, you made a mistake here. You didn't put a doorknob on it. He said, no, I made no mistake. The doorknob's on the inside. The doorknob's on the inside. They have to open it. The Lord doesn't force himself. He doesn't kick the door in. Say, All right, get out of here. He doesn't do that. He re he's in kindness and grace and mercy. He wants us to open up to the words of love. He wants us to do that. Hmm. He says, if you'll do that, he says, I'll come in. I won't chide you. I won't take out and beat you. I'll come in. I'll come in and meet with you. Now, you could be talking about the individual. You could be talking about the church. But he'll come in. And when he comes in, what does he like to do? Well, the same thing you guys like to do, especially last Thursday. I saw the pictures on Facebook. Yeah, you guys stuffing your faces with all the food, the miles long tables with everything on it. We did it too. I will come in. We like doing that. It's a very human thing that the Lord enters in with. In fact, our only celebration that we have for the Lord, we don't have the seven feasts of Jehovah. We have a table. He likes it. He likes that. He says, you open it up, I'll come in and eat with you. We like eating with people. It's fun. It's communal. It's, it's, you get to laugh. You, you get, to, you get to 
you talk about things you don't normally talk about. You, your guard goes down when you're sitting around eating with somebody. You who are a businessman, when are the best deals done? Over a meal. Over a meal. That's when they do it, you know? The Lord Jesus wants to come in and dine. Many of us have different backgrounds in our Christianity. Many of you will remember this song. We don't sing it around here too much. The Savior's waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before. And now he's waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. You know that one, Shirley? <laughs> yeah, she was going, she was singing along there with me. If you'll take one step towards his Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him, and all of your darkness will end within your heart. He'll abide. He knocks. He wants in. You let me in, I'll dine with you. If you overcome, I'm not giving you a little mansion just over the hilltop. It's not going to be a cabin over somewhere else. Just glad that you got in by the skin of your teeth. I'll let you sit on my throne. Yikes. Now, this is good. Not just getting there, but getting there as Peter, was it Peter? An abundant entrance. An abundant entrance. Not just entering. Getting to sit with him in his throne, I'm not even sure what that all means, but it means something really good. To rule and to reign with him. He said, yeah, that's what I'll do to the overcomer. He'll get to sit with me. Well, we finished the seven churches. Let's do a quick overview. Ephesus, what we're supposed to learn, there are false apostles. The church has always been and will have falseness in it. We must be motivated by love. Go back to our first love. We must repent to go on. You don't go on in your own strengths. We must be aware of Nicolaitans, those who would put themselves over the people of God. From Smyrna, what did we learn? He knows our suffering. He knows what we're going through. We are at war with Satan's subjects, both religious and political. He is the power behind it. Suffering has an end. It has an end, but suffering has a reward. It has a value. And death is not the end. Well, what did we learn from Pergamos? Satan is the one behind all of this stuff that's going on. The love of money... That's one of Satan's best methods. Immorality is the result of spiritual immorality. The Lord hates the clergy laity divisions. Fellowship is more important than numbers. And beware of uniting the church with governments. Thyatira, the Son of God, is the judge in our midst. We don't hand that judgment over to anybody else. Even in apostasy, even when things are bad, we're to continue to labor well. Flee from adulterous, idolatrous religion. Overcome and reign with him. From Sardis, names mean nothing. Denominations, whatever, it means nothing. Be watchful. We have to be on our guard. Remember and repent. The Lord is concerned with you individually, and his approval is worth everything. Philadelphia, our last one, keep his word. Treasure it. Guard it. We will be delivered from the hour that is going to come upon the earth. Well, that's good to know. The Lord is concerned with you individually. Smallness in this life 
greatness in the life to come. Well, I learned Laodicea. We're either to be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Don't just go to the second law of thermodynamics and just go to lukewarm temperature of the world. Don't be satisfied with material success. That's not what it's about. Repent, as we have seen before. He's knocking. Open the door. Remember we said that the Lord used the situations of Laodicea, their wealth, their textiles, their, their eyes, their pharmaceutical industry, their, 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 their uh, wells, their, their places of water, their springs. He used all these to speak to them. Now, you think he does that to us? You think it's just by chance that you live in Tulsa, Oklahoma? That your last name is the name it is? Think it's just by chance that you live in a day where there's a plague going around or part of it? it, it that you live in a place where the democracy has gone down to the individual doing whatever he wants to do? You, you think it's by chance that all these things happen? You know what it is? He's knocking. He's knocking for us to listen, to repent, and fill ourselves with the amen, with the true and faithful witnesses, with the beginning of the creation of God, to buy gold, to buy white raiment, to buy Isaac that we might be faithful unto the end. Faithful unto the end. The Savior is knocking. So what do we do? There's a great throne for the overcomers. We read, we hear, and we keep the words of the prophecy.